Imagine a way. But we do have some help from the Word. What a day that's going to be and what a time and what a place. Amen. It's good to see you today. Those of you I can see, so you're hiding in the corners. We had a men's dinner Friday night. What a great, great blessing that was. Barry Carter shared his testimony. He had a good group of men there. Good food, good fellowship, and good time in the Lord. Amen. Uh, all you guys put that together and you ladies that helped. Thank you so very, very much. Uh, I know they'll probably say something else about it, but the ladies retreat. Ladies, let me just say this. It's not too late. Uh, if you haven't signed up and you got this thing going on in your heart and head that kind of keeps prodding you about it and pushing you about it, that means you're supposed to go. I don't have any money. Don't worry about it. You're supposed to go anyway. All right? Uh, God will take care of all those things. You just need to let someone know it after the service. Will be, uh, Rebecca will be hanging around back at the ladies' table, putting information out for those who are going. You can pick up your information at the table about all the things that are involved, the 6.30 uh, revi- arrival time and a revival time. But uh, uh, make sure you just don't miss it when these opportunities are given to us. We have these, these conferences and these seminars uh, because God leads us to have them. And they're always great times in the Lord. We're in a series of messages dealing with the miracles of Jesus. Amen? And we've been going through them and trying to hit most of them. Now, some of these miracles that the Lord did are real close to another. I mean, they're almost the same scenario, different person, obviously. Uh, we're trying to pick out, you know, if, if, if one's kind of duplicated, we'll just deal with one of, those, one of those two or three like that. But we're probably doing about 17 to 18 of the miracles of Jesus and trying to kind of do them in as, well, as closely as possible in the chronological order uh, that we can find them. But uh, throughout the scriptures, some of these miracles are only in one gospel. Some are in all four gospels. Some are just in two gospels. Some are mentioned in three gospels. But nonetheless, they are the, the, these activities of the Lord Jesus that were supernatural. When you look at them, there's no explanation other than God does something extraordinary and supernatural. Now, the, the word miracle in scripture really translates the word sign. We've shared that with you each week. But it's important to know that because there's specific signs. One to attest to the fact that Jesus is who he says he is. He is, the, he is the son of David. He is Messiah. He's the Christ, God's anointed one. But he's also God in the flesh. And that there's, there's, I think in Nicodemus who came to him, nobody could do these miracles except God were with him. Well, more than just God being with him, he was God, all right? And all these miracles completely testify to that fact. We had all these hundreds of prophecies declaring the Messiah would come in the Old Testament. And now we see the fulfillment in the New Testament and every miracle has a message to it that goes just beyond the obvious that, well, the Lord did something supernatural here. We talk about that aspect, but also there's something for us to learn as we study these, these passages of Scripture and we look at what the Lord Jesus does in each one of these. We're looking at our eighth in the series of the miracles of Jesus from the book of Matthew. Just a couple of verses there. And we'll also notice as we look at this, It's mentioned in Mark as well as Luke. So three of the Gospels talk about this specific miracle that the Lord Jesus, where this woman presses through the crowd and touches the hem of the garment of the Lord Jesus. So I think there's great lessons of commitment here and convictions, determination, desperation that we we can glean from this. Uh, I don't know about you, but uh, having studied this all week and then preaching it already once in our early service at the other campus, uh, there's a message here for each one of us, no matter where we're at. Uh, maybe you don't know the Lord. Maybe you do know the Lord. There's something God wants to say to you this morning. And I just pray that you'll have the ears to hear whatever God is saying to you today. Because I do believe there's a message for each one of us. As we look in the scripture, uh, uh, I'll put it the Matthew 9 up on the boards here and on the wall here. It says, and behold, a woman who'd been suffering uh, from a hemorrhage for 12 years came up to him behind him and touched the fringe or the hem of his garment of his cloak. For she was saying to herself, if I could only touch his garment, then I shall get well. But Jesus, turning and seeing her, said, daughter, take courage. Your faith has made you well. And all at once the woman was made whole. Another of the Gospels puts it a little differently where it says that uh, Jesus turns to his disciples and says, someone touched me. Uh, and, he's, and, and the disciples say, Lord, you know, there's a great amount of people here, obviously. Everybody's touching everybody as you go through the crowd. And, and it was. In fact, if you read the story and you look at the, the context of it, one of the officials from the synagogue has come to Jesus and in brokenness just shared with the Lord Jesus how his daughter was, had died. And he says to Jesus, his name is Jairus, and he says, if you just come to my house and, and, and you could raise my daughter from the dead. In fact, Jesus is agreeing to do that. And he's on his way, and as he goes, you know 
uh, being this high temple official that everybody in the community knows what's going on, and they're following. There's probably, if not, if not thousands, there's at least many, many hundreds of hundreds of people pressing in. In fact, one of the gospels says many were pressing in on the disciples and Jesus. So there's just a, just a bulk of activity as the people are pressing through these narrow streets, following Jesus to Jairus' house. And then in the crowd is this woman who makes her way through the crowd saying, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I know <coughs> that I should be healed. Now, what a powerful story. And I want us to look at it in, in a way that we realize that not only did this happen, and this, there's this historical event that we can read in, in testimony of three of the Gospels, but also that as I read it and as we preach it and teach it today, that we would say, hey, well, God, what do you have for me from this message today? Because I do believe the Word of God is, is alive and it's powerful, and everything in here can still speak to us today and draw us closer to God and do some things in our life that are just in themselves supernatural and miraculous. But as we look at this today, I kind of broke it down into to about five points here. First of all, to look at her disease. The multitudes following Jesus. Mark says they were pressing in on him. And in the crowd was this woman who has this hemorrhage. And she's had this hemorrhage of, of blood for, for 12 years. Jesus is on the way, remember, to Jairus' place to, to minister. One thing's on his mind, get to the house and, and, and raise this girl from the dead. And then suddenly, as they're journeying, there's an interruption. And the interruption becomes an opportunity. As he's going, this woman presses through. Jairus' daughter, I think it's approximately one of the Gospels says 12. For 12 years, you know, this, this woman's had this disease. The little girl's 12 years old. For 12 years, the little girl's enjoyed her family, the laughter of mom and dad and, and those around him. She's known as a young little girl the, about the sunshine of life, you know, those, those up to 12 years of age of happiness. Well, this woman, just the opposite. For 12 years, she's been miserable. For 12 years, she's had this, this, this stigma and this hemorrhage, which was worse, if not equal to, the issue of leprosy. Remember when we talked about how Jesus touched the leper and healed him? And another occasion, he heals 10 lepers. But how that uh, those lepers <laughs> had to live by certain restrictions. I mean, they, they couldn't live in a walled city. They, they were treated kind of like, you know, don't go don't, don't near them. You know, you pick up whatever they got. It, it was an incurable disease. The stigma was there. They had to dress a certain way. They had to let it be known when they were in the street, when others were on the street, by yelling out unclean, un unclean. Had to dress in a way and cover themselves in certain ways so as not to contaminate anyone around them. The law considered the lepers unclean. Well, here's this woman with this disease who's kind of in the same situation. And it, it, she was, it had this hemorrhaging that took place for 12 years and this humiliation that would come from it. Can you imagine just going through this for, for 12 years? And, and the affliction was such that it was, uh, it was probably a common occurrence in, in the day of, the, of, of historical writings because even uh, the law had something to say about it. And the Talmud, which is just kind of a... Con, uh, uh, I guess you'd call it a commentary on the, on the law and the commentary on, on the word. In fact, uh, the, the Jewish Talmud prescribed 11 different cures for this. Now, the Bible itself, the, the Torah and Leviticus, I'll show you a scripture in a moment that talked about it. But the Talmud, one of the 11, well, let me give you three of them that I thought were unique to show you that they really weren't remedies. They were more superstitions and they weren't based upon the actual words from the word of God. Among the remedies... Uh, one was, 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 was that of carrying the, the ashes of an ostrich egg in a linen bag in the summertime. Now, if it's wintertime, you would carry the ashes of the ostrich egg in a cotton bag. I'm just telling you what I know. <laughs> Another involved, one of these cures involved taking a barley corn, a, a kernel, right, that had been found in the dung of a white female donkey. And you would carry that around and hope to be cured from it. So you can see that there was a bit more superstition than reality. Now the Mosaic Law talked about this. Uh, this woman who would suffer this discharge. It says this, that uh, the, the woman who suffered this discharge of her blood many days, not at the period of her menstrual impurity, or if she was to discharge beyond that period, all the days of impure discharge, shall continue as though she were in her menstrual impurity. She's unclean. Any bed which she lies all the days of her discharge shall be like to the bed of her menstruation. And everything on which she sits shall be unclean, like the uncleanness of that at time, like 
Likewise, whoever touches them is unclean, and they shall wash their clothes and bathe in water and be clean until evening, Leviticus 15. In other words, there's this, this, there's this ceremonial cleansing prescribed by the law that you would go through, but this woman has gone well beyond uh, the period of, of this cycle, and now you know, she has this hemorrhaging for 12 years. For 12 years, you know, uh, it, it, it's a tragedy because she's considered kind of like the lepers. There's no relationships established. There's, there's no friendships. There's no fellowship. In fact, it, it creates quite a dilemma in the life of this person. It says that she had endured, as, as, a, as a matter of fact, much at the hand of many physicians, had spent all that she had and was not helped at all, but had rather grown worse. It's just getting worse. Mark writes at this, that, that she'd endured these, these, at the hand of many physicians. Luke put it this way. Remember, Luke's a physician. Perhaps he's concerned about the reputation of the physicians. When he writes, he says that she could not be healed by anyone. He didn't put it she'd suffered much at the hand of many physicians. Of course, anybody who's dealt with any kind of long-term diseases know what it feels like to be, you know, in a kind of situation where you've suffered much through your illness and no one's able to help you. And it seems that nobody has the answers. And not only is that, that bad enough and the frustration from that, but to be excluded you know, creates another problem all itself. Here's a woman who has a problem, and it just gets worse and worse and worse, and for 12 years, she hadn't been able to fellowship with people. She can't go to the synagogue. She's considered unclean. She can't participate in the feast. She can't go to Jerusalem at Passover. She's unclean. You talk about isolation and loneliness and frustration and despair. She's spending everything that she has, you know, so to just to get out of this place of this isolation, this social, religious isolation, so much so, now she's penniless, all right? She spent all her resources on ineffective treatments and probably a few charlatans in, in the mix as well. What a, what a terrible place to be in life. What a horrible place to find yourself, and here she is. But I want you to also notice this morning her desperation. She's turned everywhere you could turn, and now there's nowhere else to turn until she hears about Jesus. And she comes up behind him, and the phrase that she was saying to herself could more precisely be rendered, she kept saying to herself. In other words, it, it has this idea of reputation, uh, of repetition. So she sees Jesus. She's heard what he's done. He's, he's healed the sick. He's cast out demons. He's cleansed lepers. He's raised the dead. So her situation, which seems so hopeless, now appears to have an element of hope to it. Maybe there's a way. Maybe there's an answer. In fact, it, the idea here, she's coming through this crowd, and she's probably touching a lot of people, which is against the law, all right? She's, and she's pressing through to touch Jesus, which she's not supposed to do. And she's saying to herself over and over and over in her mind, if I could just touch the hem of his garment. I could be made with, if I could just, if I could just get through the crowd, if I can just reach him, if I can just, just touch the, if I could just get a hold and just touch, the, I, I could be healed. If I, it's, it's the idea that there's such desperation in, in this situation that she's in, that she's just saying it over and over and over and over to herself, that if I could just get through. In fact, according to biblical requirements, Jewish men were to uh, make themselves, uh, tassels on the four corners of their garment, which would be the, the hem of the garment. And there would be the, these tassels, uh, uh, these, these threads and cords that would be woven in such a, a pattern, according to the law, they represented something. These tassels were on the, the garments of the men to, uh, to testify to the world around them uh, their loyalty, their commitment, and, and the color of the cords, and blue, and loyalty, and royalty, and, and the white, uh, representing the holiness and, and purity. They, they were all there to testify and represent a, a man who is faithful to God, loyal to the Word of God, and committed to be a devoted follower of Jehovah God. And so religious, righteous Jewish men would wear these tassels so that wherever they went, number one, it reminded them about their walk and where they were going with the Lord, but also reminded the world around them and testified to the world around him that these were men of God. They belonged to the people of God. Now, the Pharisees, there's the, they had, you know, the, consistent with their typical uh, uh, hypocrisy and pretension, they, according to Jesus, uh, in Mark, Matthew 2, he talked about how they lengthened the tassels of their garments in order to call attention to their devotion. So they just wasn't content to have the tassel there. You know, they, they had the long flowing tassels and, and wanted to make a show out of it and let everybody see how, how spiritual they were. Now, during the Holocaust years and times during, in Germany and in Europe, 
when uh, the Jews were being gathered up and sent into prison camps, uh, many of those persecuted Jews in Europe wore their tassels on their undergarments. They weren't exposed for fear of being taken prisoner somewhere. Modified forms in more recent days, you've probably seen the Hasidic Jews and perhaps other uh, Jews who, are, who are, 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 are devout Jews have, a, have their to- tassels sewn on, on a prayer shawl. He talked about the talit, which is the, the Jewish prayer shawl the men would have. And on the four corners of the prayer shawl were, were those tassels and, uh, that, that they would wear. This is what she's trying to get to. She's trying to just touch the hem of his garment because she says, if I could, if I could just get there, if I could just touch that, I know, I just know I could, I could be healed. And she does. She makes her way through the crowd and we see at this point her detection where Luke 8 says, Jesus says, who's the one who touched me? And while they were all denying it, Peter said, master, the people are crowding and pressing in on you. And Jesus said, someone did touch me for I'm aware that power had gone out of me. Now this woman realizing now that she's not going to escape detection. She's not going to be able to just kind of slip in, touch the garment and slip out. All of a sudden Jesus stops. He draws attention to the whole thing and, and, and her embarrassment and in her shame, in this detecting moment, she, she comes and she falls down in, in front, of, front of the Lord Jesus Christ and, and, you know, begins to confess what she's done. Now, you catch the words of the Lord Jesus, what does he say? He doesn't say, woman, I'm on my way to a very important prestigious man's house by the name of Jairus. I've been invited. I don't have time for this. In fact, he speaks just the opposite. He stops, he takes full notice of what's going on, he speaks to her, he calls her daughter. Take courage, your faith has made you well. In fact, the idea, the way it reads in the tense of the original language of the Greek language is Jesus is, is, is saying that when you touched me, you were made well. In fact, the scripture talks about, you know, uh, that she knew she was, she was healed. She'd become aware of the miraculous occurrence in her own body at that moment. And now Jesus is testifying, now you have been made well kind of confirming what, what has already happened. And it's amazing to me to see again the, the, the grace, the compassion of Jesus. And even more amazing when I compare it to the grace and the compassion of Joe. <laughs> or, or some of us who might be a little perturbed, we've been disturbed, whatever it might be, how we can get into the hustle bustle of, of the contemporary world that we live in. And we see... We have our mindset on something. It seems there's so many distractions and we get so easily frustrated. He just turns around and calls her daughter, encourages her, lets her know she's been touched and lets her know she's been healed. Now, you, you have to understand, thousands of people are touching him. But this woman's touch is a, a little different and he, he makes reference to that and he lets her know, you know, that God has done a work in her life. Because when she touches him, it's not like a lot of people. There's a lot of people who touch Jesus. You can read through history. A lot of people that touch Jesus and they were around Jesus. A lot of people who beat Jesus, all right? But not everybody's ultimately changed by Jesus. There's a lot of people who came to Jesus out of curiosity. The rich young ruler. What can I do? Others. Some of the Pharisees who came and questioned Jesus. But a lot of those people went away unchanged. But here's someone who comes in genuine faith, really believing, who comes in absolute desperation, does everything she can do to get to him, to see him do something that nobody else has been doing. She presses her way through. And what does he do? He receives her. He's not being interrupted on at all. In fact, look at, look at what happens with, with this deliverance and how this healing takes place. And I want you to catch this because when she's healed and when he says he's healed, it's a little different from the way we don't see it in the English language as we do as much in the original language of the Greek. The Greek word for healing, physical healing, was the word ilmea. And it was a term used by Mark when he explained uh, that the woman was, was, was healed of her affliction. It's a word commonly used when somebody was healed of something. But when you get into the actual rendering of what the scripture has to say about this particular lady in this particular place, it's kind of a different reference. Luke uses a word in other places for healing. It's the word uh, therapeuo, which we get the word therapeutic from, all right? And uh, the, 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 it was therapeutic for her. In other words, she experienced a, a healing. She couldn't be healed by anyone. The word Luke used there was the word therapeutic. 
All right. When, when Mark talked about it again, he talked about, you know, the, the healing in, in this regard. But there are some other references to being made well in Scripture, and one of them is used specifically of this particular lady. In fact, three references that I, that I want to draw your attention to real quick. One in Matthew 9, as well as the parallel passages in Mark 5 and Luke 8. They don't use this word ilmai there. They use this word sozo. You say, what's the difference between sozo and ilmai? Sozo is a word that usually is used in the New Testament for being saved. You know, receiving eternal life in Jesus Christ. All right? It's that New Testament term that we talked about to be saved, to put your faith in Jesus Christ, and to be saved from your sins. That's the word sozo. And, and even though in the English it's not as clear in the rendering here in the translations here, it should have been, they should have used this word that she was saved. Not just healed. It went beyond that. It's the word used when, when Bartimaeus, and we'll probably talk about Bartimaeus in one of our messages on healing. Remember, he's standing by the road saying, Son of David, Son of David. And Jesus says, you know, what do you want from me? And he wants, to, he wants his sight back. And the Lord restores his sight. And the Lord speaks to him and he says, Go your way. Your faith has made you well. All right? That's the way it's translated in English. But the, 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 the Greek word in the original language is, Your faith has saved you. It's the word sozo, you know. It's in connection with a person's faith in Jesus is healing their soul, making them a new person in Christ Jesus. Why would he do that for Bartimaeus? Bartimaeus had recognized the deity and the messiahship of Jesus by calling him son of David and did it repeatedly. It was a common messianic title. Recognizing when so many didn't, Bartimaeus a blind man saw more than most who had sight could see. He understood that he was the Christ. He believed that Jesus was the Messiah. <clears throat> so it seems probable that his being made well or saved, like this woman with this hemorrhage, included not just a physical healing, not just being cured of, of a sickness, but saved. Their eternal soul being saved from hell, saved as in salvation. This is what he says to Bartimaeus. He doesn't use this word with everybody, but there's these, these references here. One with this woman, another with Bartimaeus. Another time this terminology is used with the prostitute who you know, washed Jesus' feet <coughs> with her tears and she wiped him with her hair. He spoke the same words. The Greek little phrase would be something like, hey, pistis su can say, which means your faith has made you well. So he speaks to this woman with the hemorrhage. He speaks to Bartimaeus. And the English translations of the phrase are not always the same. Luke 7, 50, it's rendered like this. Your faith has saved you. And that clearly indicates that the restoration she experienced was spiritual. All right? Spiritual healing. Now, with her, remember, to the prostitute, there was no physical healing needed, was there? It was a spiritual salvation that she needed and she came in humility and recognized who Jesus was and she is saved as a result of it. Another illustration is found with the 10 lepers. Remember the 10 lepers came and they asked Jesus to cure them and the Bible reports that in Luke 17 that all 10 were cleansed. The word there in the Greek language is carthesio. Like we get the word catharsis. It's, it's a healing that took place. But remember out of the 10, how many returned? <clears throat> Just one came back, right? And he came back to give thanks to the Lord for what had happened. And Jesus, in verse 19 of that passage, in Luke 17, says those same words where he takes them. He peaced us through so can say, which means your faith has saved you. Now, nine were cleansed. One was cleansed and saved. Nine experienced the <coughs> external thing. But, you know, it's, it's unfortunate the English translation doesn't, doesn't really give us that, that much clarity on it. I know I've got a cough drop here. Nobody has allergy problems with me, right? I know some of you think I've been smoking cheap cigars, but that's not true. <coughs> I haven't been smoking any cigars, much less cheap ones. Go ahead and cough with me. It makes you feel better. Some of you want to right now. <coughs> so, not only made well but saved. And this is what happens with this woman. Twelve years of misery. Twelve years of isolation. Twelve years of no friendships and no relationships and no fellowship. Can't go to the church. Can't be around the people of God. 
But when she reaches through in her desperation and faith and she touches the hem, just touching the hem of the garment of Jesus Christ, there's this redemptive aspect that's involved in all of this. And each one of those incidents with Bartimaeus and the prostitute and that one leper as well. Something beyond the healing. And by the way, let me just say this about faith and healing. Because a lot of people say, you know, well, if you just had enough faith, you could be healed. But you need to study your Bible. In the gospel accounts, we read that multitudes of people got healed. Completely apart from any faith. They didn't exercise any faith. They were just healed. On their part or on the part of some other person, healing took place. It doesn't say that they believed anything, they trusted anything, they, you know, but, but healing took place. Jesus performed these miracles of healing. And when he performed them, they were based solely upon the sovereign will of God and what God was doing in the moment. You know, it was, and many times it's a response to faith in somebody's heart and life, but it wasn't conditioned on it. He just healed someone. So don't get caught in this little scenario that, well, you don't have enough faith to be healed or you're, not, or you're still sick because you didn't believe enough. I mean, the centurion servant, remember we talked about him a couple of weeks ago, and he had this servant, and he was a Gentile, and he had a servant, and he just said, speak the words. You don't have to come to my house. And it says in that hour that the servant was healed. Well, he didn't believe anything. He didn't even see Jesus. He never came in contact with Jesus. A little while later, Jesus goes to Jairus' house, and there's that 12-year-old girl. He raised her up from the dead. She didn't believe anything, did she? She was dead. She couldn't exercise any faith. All right? So understand, don't get caught in this trap talking about healing and faith. It's, it's not relative here. All right? The issue is here is that the, the Lord is touching lives. He's showing that he's the king of glory. He's showing that he has authority over all sin. All sickness, all disease, over the winds, the waves, the weather. I mean, Jesus had absolute authority. Some were saved by faith when they put their faith in Jesus. But understand, it's not the faith, it's Jesus that saves. Some people say, well, I just need more faith. No. More faith won't do anything. It's Jesus that makes the difference. And we put our trust, and sometimes if you were here for our recent series we did on why God allows suffering, you see that there are times when suffering has a far greater value than what most of us in our physical understanding can grasp. But God may be doing a deeper healing in your life in some other area of your life and willing to allow you to suffer in some part so you can experience his grace in greater parts in your life. But I want you to understand about this faith and healing. No one is ever saved apart from faith. All right? You might be healed apart from faith, but you're never going to be saved apart from faith. It seems, it seems the reason to believe the woman touched Jesus' garment that day, she trusted him for, for just the whole total work in her heart and life. You know, that God just touched her life. I'm desperate. I have no answers. It, it's, it's like we, 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 in, in life, I, there was that point and stage in my life I came to realize that <clears throat> I'm doing a pretty sorry job of running my life. I'm empty. I need answers. I need help. I can't help myself. I've tried. I did the good works thing. I did the religious thing. I'm still empty. You get the point of desperation, and you reach out to the Lord as much as you know how and as much as you can comprehend, and in faith, you put your trust in Him. You give Him heart and mind and soul and life. You trust Him. The Bible says by faith we're saved, you know? But it's by grace through faith. But ultimately, God's grace is extended, and you can trust God, and you can be saved. Well, the issue of healing might be something else, but the idea is that you're not going to be saved until you trust. In fact, it really boils down to this. There's two things in life, really, that bring anybody, man, woman, young person, to Jesus Christ. And one is, is first of all, a deep felt sense of personal need. And the other element is that of genuine faith to really put your trust in God. The woman with the hemorrhage obviously had both. She trusted God. And she obviously had this deep sense of, understood need in her heart and life. Now, that's the same with each of us. And sometimes it takes most of us a little longer to get to that place of desperation. And sometimes it's, it's not till we hit the very bottom that we get desperate for God to do something like that. Before that, we're kind of shooting up little prayers and making little shallow commitments and, you know, well, God, you know, you do this for me, I'll do this. Kind of bartering with God. There's no barter system here. The way that we get into God's presence is through humility, with an understanding. Just as this woman, I, you know, she's just humble before the Lord. I, I don't deserve this. I haven't earned this. But if you don't do something for me, I have no other recourse. I have no other hope. There's no other way that I'm ever going to make it. There's no other way I'm ever going to live. 
If you don't do something for me. I don't know, have you ever been there? Well, if you've been there and you responded towards the Lord the right way, it's the best place, though it might have been the worst place you've ever been. And maybe you're kind of on the edge of that. Maybe you're afraid to let desperation kind of, you don't want to go through that doorway, so to say. And you're doing everything you can, you know. It, it, it's kind of, I hear people like, oh, Lord, pray. I just pray you use me and, and break me. <laughs> they pray it really nicely at the altar. But when they walk out the door and God starts doing something to bring them to that place, or, you know, a real trust and brokenness, not, then they're fighting all the way. And screaming and kicking all the way. I didn't mean this. <laughs> The Lord knows exactly what it will take in our hearts and our lives if we're willing to allow him to bring us to a place of despair even. And just say that in my desperation, you know, look how many times in the Psalms it talks about that. In my despair, in my pit, in my isolation, in my trouble, in my suffering. You know, Job said, now I see the Lord. I've heard of you by the ear, but now I get it. And it's usually this point of desperation. And it's, but as long as you can fix yourself, you know, as long as you can justify what you're doing, rationalize your behavior, you know, blame somebody else for the situation, the problem, and not get desperate, then God's not doing anything in your life. I hate to tell you that that's just the following the story of the Bible. People who got desperate saw God. Moses, you want to see a picture of a man in desperation. There's no, he's done what God told him to do. Even the judgments of God on the nation of Egypt didn't convince Pharaoh. Now finally, the firstborn are dying, and he tells them to get out of town. And as they leave, they get to the Red Sea, and obviously Pharaoh's changed his mind again. And they're pursuing to destroy and completely annihilate a whole generation of Jews. Millions. That's the plan. And we have no army here. I got Moses with a big stick in his hand. And about five million people complaining. Well, why would you bring us out here to die in the desert? Moses gets desperate. What am I going to do, God? What am I going to do? You stand on the brink of the Red Sea and you raise that rod up high. And in that moment of desperation and faith and belief, God did a miracle. How many times do you see that through Scripture? How many times have we seen it in our own lives? When we genuinely get hungry and desperate for God to do something in us, do something with us, do something in our children, do something in our marriage, do something in our finances, we just get hungry before God. Say, God, if you don't, if you don't do something here, we're sunk. Jehoshaphat, we've told you that story so many times, I feel like I'm starting to sound like a broken record. He's surrounded by every enemy that they have. Jerusalem is surrounded. They come in, Jehoshaphat, we're sunk, we're doomed, we're dead. There's no way out. Jehoshaphat rends his garments, calls a fast and looks to heaven. God, we don't know what to do, but our eye is on you. That's where this woman's at, isn't it? I don't know what to do, but I'm looking to you. I don't know where to turn. I don't have any more words to say. I just know if you don't come through, God, I'm sunk. I've been there. Have you? Many of you have. Some of you may be there right now in your life. If God doesn't come through, it's done. And that's not the will of God. God wants something of his glory in your life. God wants a testimony of his grace in your life. God wants to do something that brings a change in your heart and grace and glory. I mean, if you look at this, here's this woman in desperation and in faith. I mean, just think about it for a moment. You say, well, you know, my situation, hey, listen, you don't think God's aware? You don't think God knows? You don't think God's certain, you know, that he can do something in your life? Here's, here's Jesus. And you think, well, I don't deserve it, or I haven't done this, or I haven't been a good person. No, you haven't. That's your nature to sin. But here's this woman who's an outcast from everything in the culture. And he's on his way to the house of a man with great prestige. Jesus, he ministered equally to that woman as he did to Jairus, to the leading elder of the synagogue, which gives us a clear picture of his divine impartiality. He's not a respecter of persons. 
He looks on us equally. He's not offended when, when this woman presses through and takes a hold of the tassel with her unclean hands. He's not, he's not resentful for her presuming on him while he's trying to do something else He's engulfed by a demanding audience at the same time on his way to raise a little girl from a deathbed. She still presses through. Let me say it like this. Nobody has ever interfered with Jesus' ministry. And you better praise the Lord for that. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Matthew 20, 28. He came to serve. And the beauty of that is, here's this royal king of glory who wants to do something in our lives. Who wants to touch your heart. Who wants to touch your home. Who wants to touch your mind. Who wants to touch your spirit. He came to seek and to save desperate, lost sinners. Even while we were without Christ, while we were yet in our sins, Christ died for the ungodly. Listen, the apostle Paul made it very clear and he says, we need to take a matter to, uh, to uh, remember. Uh, here's, here's the verse in, in 1 Corinthians 1. He says, I want you to consider this, that you're calling, brethren. That you, you are not many uh, wise according to the flesh, and not many mighty, and not many noble. God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God chose the weak things of this world to shame the things that are strong. And the base things of this world, he, and the despised, God's chosen the things that are not that he might nullify the things that are. What does that mean? It goes all the way back to the garden. Before the garden, the devil, one of the chief angels in heaven, rebels against God. And God, in response, creates the earth out of nothing and puts a man in the garden with a woman. And with this creation, with this creation, he's going to put a man on display, a man who doesn't have the power of the devil, a man who doesn't have the rank of the devil, a man... That God is going to redeem ultimately through his son who becomes a man. And he's going to declare to the cosmos, to the universe, to all things. That God can take the basest, the weakest of all things and display his glory. That's what God wants to do in your life. If you're sitting around sulking and thinking, I just don't matter things, I don't know answers, there's no peace, there's no, there's no way. He is the way. He is the peace. He is the life. You can trust him. And you need to let some of that remorse perhaps or self-remorse or pity, whatever it might be that we wrap ourselves in so many times, our misery, let it turn into desperation. Say, God, I need you. You're the only one who's going to deliver me. Well, I don't deserve it. Well, you better be glad God's more gracious than men, amen. God never excuses our disobedience, our unfaithfulness. But God still forgives us. But I think the thing that we fail to do so many times is just come humbly. We, we don't want to recognize that perhaps we can't do this. Well, you can't. But he can. He'll forgive you of every sin. He'll forgive you of every issue in your life. All you have to do is get desperate. And put it out of the atoning blood of Jesus Christ. Position prestige, possessions. It gives you no advantage with God. He accepts all who come humbly. Peter, Peter learned it uh, in, in the book of Acts in chapter 10 when he says, you know, God is not one to show partiality. Paul expressed it when he wrote the Galatians when he says, you know, there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free man, there's neither male nor female in Christ. It's not important. Status, position, Gender, come to Christ. Throw yourself on his mercy. Allow God to do something. For some, it means giving your life to Jesus. For others, it means getting right with God in some area of your life. So for others, it might just say, hey, I've carried this burden. I can't carry it anymore. I'm laying it on the cross. I'm going to trust God with this issue in my heart and my home. This woman is a great picture. She had an issue of blood, the Bible calls it. What's your issue? He deals with issues. And some of us got issues. Amen. Would you stand with your head bowed today?